Section 8.1 is an introduction to sequences and series. When we talk about a sequence, make sure that you understand that we are going to start n, which is our counting term, at 1. So when it asks for the first four terms of a sequence given by a n equals 3n minus 2, that just means I'm going to plug in n equals 1, n equals 2, 3, and 4 to get those terms. So doing the math, if I plug in 1, I get an answer of 1. If I plug in 2, 3 times 2 is 6, minus 2 gives me 4. If I plug in 3, 3 times 3 is 9, minus 2 gives me 7. And if I plug in 4, 4 times 3 is 12, minus 2 gives me 10. So the sequence would look like 1, 4, 7, 10, dot, 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 assuming it goes on but we were only asked to find the first four terms. Same idea for number two. Go ahead and plug in n equals one and see what happens. Maybe pause the video and see if you get the same answers that I do. So when we do negative one to the first power, we get negative one, so three minus one is two. But when we do negative one squared, we get positive one, so three plus one is four. Any odd exponent is going to make it minus 1, which will give me 2, and any even exponent is going to make it plus 1, which will give me 4. Okay, now we need to go the other way. We're given the sequence, and we need to find the equation a sub n that would give us that sequence. So remember that we're starting at n equals 1, and then 2, and then 3, and then 4. So it's kind of like a little xy table although we don't use x, we use n. n and then a sub n. When n is 1, I should get 1. When n is 2, I should get 3. When n is 3, I should get 5. And when n is 4, I should get 7. So sometimes you can see the pattern pretty easily. One thing to keep an eye on is what's happening in between each term. This is adding 2. This is adding 2. This is adding 2. So if it's adding the same amount each time, it's basically like the equation of a line. So a sub n is basically like our y equals, it's just a fancy sequence notation. It's adding 2, so our slope is 2n. But remember, when you write the equation of the line, this number represents the y-intercept. So it's when n equals 0, so you have to kind of take your table a step back and ask yourself, what would have come before 1? And since it's adding 2 each time, if I subtract 2, I would see that negative 1 would have been the y-intercept. And the equation of our sequence is a sub n equals 2n minus 1. Sometimes they're not as easy. So looking at this sequence, n is just counting terms, 1, 2, 3, 4. The terms go 2, 5, 10, 17. If I check the gap this time, this is plus 3, and this is plus 5, this is plus 7. So it's not a constant change, so it's not going to be as simple as the equation of a line. So then we look at it and see if we can find any other patterns, maybe just between n and a sub n. How do I go from 1 and get 2? Well, there's lots of ways to do that. But the same equation has to get me from 2 to 5 and from 3 to 10. These ones look a little easier for me because I know 2 squared is 4 plus 1 makes 5 and 3 squared is 9 plus 1 makes a sub n sorry it makes 10 so if I take n and I square it and I add 1 and then make sure you check does that work for this one 4 squared is 16 plus 1 makes 7 so this is the equation for number 4 Okay, moving on to the next page, factorials. When you see a number with an exclamation point, like I have here, that's not five. That's five factorial. And what it means in math is a short way to write five, because that's the number we started with, times one less, four, times one less, three, times one less, two, times one less, one. Multiplying by one doesn't do anything, but we still count from the number down to one, and it's multiplying the whole time. 5 times 4 
times 3 times 2, the answer would be 120. So the factorial symbol, not an exclamation point, means start at the number given, multiply by 1 less, 1 less, 1 less, until you get to 1. So we can use that to simplify. If I have 8 factorial over 2 factorial, 6 factorial, first thing I notice is the biggest number on the bottom. Well, let me rephrase that. The biggest number is clearly on top. That's going to be the one I expand. I'm going to do 8 times 7 times. But I want to keep an eye on the next biggest number on the bottom, the 6 factorial. Instead of continuing 6 times 5 times dot, 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 I could instead do 6 factorial because 6 times 5 times 4 times 3, that's the same as 6 factorial. And by stopping at 6 factorial, I'll be able to cross it out with the 6 factorial on the bottom. 2 factorial is just 2 times 1. So by stopping at 6 factorial, instead of listing them all out, this 6 factorial will cross out with that 6 factorial. And then I can also reduce 2 goes into 8 4 times. I'm left with 4 times 7, so the answer would be 28. So I don't need to multiply them all out until I'm done. So take a look at number 2. The 5 factorial on top is going to match up pretty nicely with the 6 factorial on bottom. So expand the biggest one. So 6 times, instead of 5 times 4 times 3 times 2, I'm going to stop at 5 factorial. That is under the 5 factorial on the top. But then I want to do the same thing with the 3 and the 2. The 3 is bigger, so I'll expand the 3, 3 times 2, but instead of times 1, I'll put the factorial. That'll match up nicely with the 2 factorial on the bottom of the other. So going to cross things out, 5 factorial, 5 factorial, 2 factorial, 2 factorial, I'm left with 6 over 3, so 1 half. Same idea when there's variables involved. Find the bigger one. So you have to ask yourself, is n bigger or is n minus 1 bigger? So hopefully we're good with n being bigger. We always assume these are positive integers. So I'm going to expand n factorial. It would be n times n minus 1. You always count down. Then it would be n minus 2, and I would keep going. But because the bottom is n minus 1 factorial, I can stop because then it will cross out with the m minus 1 factorial of the denominator, and the answer is just n. See if you can do that with number 4. So number 4, the bigger one is 2n plus 2. So expanding it would be what you start with, 2n plus 2. 1 less would be, sorry, 2n plus 1. 1 less would be 2n. In theory, I would keep going, but because I hit the denominator, I'm going to write it as a factorial so that I can then cross out the matching 2n minus, sorry, 2n factorials. And then, depending on the test, you could leave it like this, or if it's on the multiple choice final, you might, might need to multiply it out and see which one matches the given choices. Okay, summation notation. So the bottom of your page talks about sigma, the convenient notation for the sum of the terms of a finite sequence. It's summation notation or sigma. This is the Greek letter sigma, the weird looking E there. And what it does is it's saying add up all the terms you would get if you started at 1 and plugged in every number until you got to 5, that's the end, and then you added them up. So let's do that. If we plug in 1, 1 squared is 1, plus 1 is going to give me 2, plus, then I plug in 2, squared is 4, plus 1 is 5, plus, plug in 3, all the way until you get to 5. Pause the video and finish plugging in those numbers until you get to 5. When I plug in 5, 
25 plus 1 is 26, and then I would do the math. Add up all those numbers, and you should get 60 for the answer. The sigma means add them all up. Take the terms in your sequence and add them all up. There's a couple properties at the top of the next page that can help you do sigma problems a little quicker. And then we're going to work on finding the sum using those properties occasionally. So number one is the sum of a constant. So if I wrote this out, when I plug in one, I would get seven. When I plug in two, I would get seven, dot, dot, dot. When I was all done, I would end up having six sevens. So instead, using our property, we can just do six times seven, and we would know the answer is 42. For number two, one of the properties is that you can take the scalar multiplier that's in front, and you can put it in front of your sigma. I'm not changing the sigma here, but now my equation is just going to be i. So I can multiply by 4 later. So for this one, I'm just plugging in 1, 2, 3, and 4. So it's going to be 4 times. When I plug in 1, I'm going to get 1, 2, 3, 4. Add them up, and then we can multiply by 4. 7, so 10, so then the answer is 40. Another property for sigma problems is if there's addition in the middle of the sigma, you can split it into two sigma problems being added together. Notice I didn't change. The little numbers on top and bottom are called the index. I did not change those. Then we could factor the 3 out of the first sigma problem, and I'm just left with i. And then we can also, we've already done one like this that was a constant. I would have five answers of 1, so I can just do that math really quick in the next line. For my three sigma problem, it's going to be three. When I plug in one, I get one. When I plug in two, I get two, etc all the way till 5, plus this 5 from above. Add those together. 3 times 15 plus 5, 45 plus 5, the answer ends up being 50. You don't have to memorize these shortcuts, by the way. I could have just used the original sigma problem and done the whole thing by hand, but sometimes they're handy. So if I wanted to just do the original problem by hand, let me copy down the original problem again. I would just plug in 1, get an answer, plus plug in 2, get an answer, plus plug in 3, plug in 4, plug in 5, and if you added those all up, you would get 50. Okay, so this is just an intro to sequences and series, so that should be enough for you to be able to get tonight's book work done, and then bring any classes, any questions you have to class, and we'll talk about the rest of it in class next time.